Cheers guys, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast. All right, in the old Pancast today, we are gonna talk carbon steel seasoning, uh, paella pans, got a few paella thoughts. We're gonna talk about air fryers versus deep fryers, seed oils, and more. Let's jump in and get started. The first thing I wanna bring up today is a deal I saw at uh, Costco. Um, not a sponsor, uh, this is just a deal I saw that I thought you guys might be interested in. Um, if you're into Kamado uh, Joe or Kamado Grill smoking and cooking, um, Costco had Kamado Joe lump charcoal, two 20 pound bags for about $59.60. And they also come with free fire starters and I ordered mine on uh, Costco.com. I ordered two boxes, so um, 80 pounds of charcoal, and it was free delivery. So I didn't have to lug 80 pounds worth of charcoal out to my car and from my car to my porch. So that was kind of nice. And I will be doing some smoking this weekend. Paella. I've been making a good deal of paella lately, and you've seen me mention these two paella pans. Both made by the same company. I believe these were Garcimas, La Paella's, and both 20 inch pans. But one is stainless steel and the other is carbon steel. So there are a few differences in the pans. Now, when it comes to the quality of the finished paella, very, very similar. I can't tell any, I don't know if I can tell any difference between the paella in the stainless steel versus the carbon steel. The differences come in the cleanup. Uh, the stainless steel, uh, when you make paella, typically there are a lot of people around and it's more of a festive occasion. And I don't often like to do dishes immediately after fixing a big meal, especially if I'm talking to guests or friends or what have you. I like the stainless steel better there because you can leave a little bit of food residue in the pan. You don't have to clean it immediately. You can put dishwash. Dishwash, dishwashing liquid and hot water in there and let it soak for a while and not worry about it even to the next morning. So I really do like that. The carbon steel, I don't like to leave anything in there and I also don't like to let it soak because as we all know around here, carbon steel can rust. So there's a little bit more immediate maintenance with the carbon steel. There is a big difference in price, however. The uh, carbon steel, about 50 bucks, more or less. And the same size pan in stainless steel, about 150 bucks. So in terms, of, in terms of value, I think the carbon steel is a much better value in terms of ease of use and cleanup. I do like the stainless steel a little bit better. So it just depends on 150 versus 50. Or if you like me, you get one of each. Um, also on paella. I've been using some of this um, Spanish paprika. And this one says dulce, which means sweet. And this one's picante, which means hot. They look very similar, if not exactly the same. Um, if you're a purist, uh, paella is not so supposed to be very hot and spicy. I accidentally reached for the uh, picante the other day and used that. And it actually put a lot of spice in the paella, maybe too much spice. But I do like just a little bit of heat and things I cook. What I did the last time is use two thirds of the amount of paprika. Uh, I used the uh, sweet and then uh, one third of my paprika, I used the, the uh, hot. And I really did think that was a good blend of kind of that sweet smokiness and a little bit of kick at the end. Uh, when it comes to changing a recipe, for example, substituting one paprika for another in something like a Paella, this gets into a little bit of philosophy here. Um, one time I took a Jacques Pepin online uh, cooking course, about uh, I think about 300 lessons and very helpful. But one of the things he said, and I am paraphrasing here, but he said that when you make someone else's recipe, it kind of honors them if you follow the recipe exactly about three times. And then after that, you've kind of learned the recipe, you start making your own changes and then it becomes essentially your recipe after that. Um, with something like paella, where it is kind of the uh, national dish of Spain, if you will, that's what a lot of people say. I think maybe instead of three times, you need to try and do that traditional method 
I don't know, five, six, ten times, and then start making changes. I've now done that plenty of times, and I'm comfortable starting to make a few uh, additions and substitutions when I make the paella, but I think it is uh, very important to honor the uh, traditional recipes the first few times you make a uh, dish. What do you guys think about that? Who knows? In paella, one of the, one of the big sticking points is that um, a lot of times people in the United States will put some chorizo sausage in there. And I think that drives people from Spain kind of crazy. And I don't think there's any ill will intended here. A lot of the traditional land-based paella recipes you see that come, especially the ones that come from Spain, call for using things like chicken, which we can get here, but also snails and uh, rabbit. And we just don't Normally, it's not very easy to get snails or rabbit here. So I think a lot of people think, well, I'll just put in some sausage, chorizo Spanish sausage, and they put it in. But the, uh, the Spanish, apparently, in the traditional sense, don't really do that. So it kind of drives them crazy when they see Americans making paella and putting in that chorizo. And one thing I do think about that chorizo is some of it is kind of like salami, really, really kind of chewy, harder type texture and it doesn't really go with the rice and the chicken in a paella. Um, so I think that's one problem with the chorizo. There's also some different chorizo you see here that is essentially like a smoked sausage, which is kind of like one step above a hot dog. I can see where that would drive some people crazy. Uh, what I have done uh, a few times and what I've done recently, uh, my local um, grocery store makes fresh pork bratwurst. And sometimes they flavor them so you can get them with a little bit of smoke. You can get them, uh, you know, mild Italian. Or sometimes they do chorizo fresh pork sausage. And I have used that a couple of times. And I think that is maybe a middle ground between rabbit and chorizo. Maybe you can use some fresh pork sausage. It doesn't have quite the same texture as that salami style uh, chorizo. Who knows? I'll probably get myself in trouble with the paella. Police, if you're wondering what I'm pouring today, this is a pint of the black stuff, some Guinness. Um, I was in the supermarket the other day on the beer aisle and I ran across this, Guinness Baltimore Blonde. Now what in the world is Guinness Baltimore Blonde? Um, in my mind, and if you go back to some of the uh, business books by Al Rees on branding and positioning, Guinness is a dark beer brewed in Ireland. It is not a blonde beer brewed in Baltimore. I saw Diageo owns Guinness these days, and I think they're actually shutting down that Baltimore brewery, and the Guinness Baltimore Blonde is going to be brewed in New York State, believe it or not. So um, it's not an Irish beer, it's not a Baltimore beer, it's not a dark beer, and it's gonna be brewed in New York. I think maybe Diageo, has a lot of people with MBAs sitting around coming up with ideas for things to do, and they may be wasting a lot of time and money. This is a Guinness, it's dark, and it's brewed in Dublin. Been to the uh, Guinness Brewery over there in Wellworth. The uh, visit, if you get a chance to uh, visit uh, Ireland. Now, occasionally in the pancast, you will see me drinking something a little stronger than a uh, Guinness. Uh, sometimes I have a little glass of scotch and I put up a poll the other day on Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Several hundred of you guys voted and I asked, if you drink scotch, what is your preferred method? 44%, uh, the number one answer is neat or straight up. 26%, um, the camp I am in is um, with some ice or on the rocks. Um, I like that because it starts out pretty strong and if you're... Still sipping on it 15 minutes later, you got essentially a scotch and water. So the ice uh, kind of changes a little bit as you drink your uh, glass of scotch. Water, soda, or mixer, 8%. And then for those who don't drink scotch, I put up an answer uh, that you don't drink it because you think it tastes like an old, dirty sweat sock, 22%. Now I got a couple of uh, comments underneath the poll. And one of them was, um, Yeti50-22422 says he drinks his in the fetal position in the shower. I like that. <laughs> Actual LOL there. And another person, I'm not going to mention his name, you can look it up if you want, um, says that scotch is an offensive term. I don't want to get a big brew 
ha ha started here but i am not sure that scotch is an offensive term he says he's from england and the scottish people actually consider it offensive um, that may be true if you're using it in the wrong context referring to someone from scotland with that word or a product from scotland uh, i think they would prefer something like scottish or scots and uh but to me the term scotch it can't be offensive because I went to Edinburgh and I went to the Scotch Whiskey Heritage Museum. They use that word on the museum marquee. Um, on my bottles of scotch, it says Scotch Whiskey. You can't get mad at people for using the word you tell them to use. So if I go to the bar and order a scotch, that is not offensive. Um, if I order five or six scotches, then I kind of tend to start becoming offensive but I don't think I'm offensive when I actually order it. So what do you guys think is the term scotch in reference to scotch whiskey, especially in America or North America outside of Scotland? Is that offensive or not? We'll see what you guys think. Okay, I put up a review the other day of this Ninja air fryer. And in that review, I kind of compared some air fried food to some food I cooked in the uh, Grandpappy deep fryer over here. And I just got to say, I am more of a fan at least in terms of flavor and texture of deep fried food rather than air fried food. And it's kind of makes it a little bit weird to do a review um, of an air fryer. I think it's a fine air fryer. It produces good air fried food. But the debate in my mind always is, is air fried food as good as deep fried? I think the air fryers do a good job with foods that come kind of with uh, grease or oil already in or on the product. And here I'm talking about things like uh, tater tots. They're already greasy. And if, you, if you're used to cooking them in a big oven, then I think cooking them in, uh, in an air fryer does a, does a fine job. They are every bit as good and perhaps a little bit better than tater tots cooked in um, a, a big oven. Some of the other stuff though, um, I cooked some salmon in that uh, review and it was okay. It was good salmon, but I just don't think it was quite as good as some of the pan-fried salmon we've cooked in some of the carbon steel videos around here. It's just a little bit drier. Now, every time I review a deep fryer, um, I typically use either peanut oil or uh, vegetable oil, sometimes canola oil, and I always get some sort of slightly hysterical comment that seed oils are basically poison, basically poison. Okay, they're probably not basically poison, but are they good for you? Are they bad for you? Um, if you read the internet, which I am wont to do, um, the seed oils are terrible for you. But if you dig a little bit deeper, I ran across an article the other day uh, entitled, Do Seed Oils Make You Sick? This one was from Consumer Reports, and they cite a Harvard study and the bottom line here is that the seed oils, even though they get a bad reputation on the internet, these quote unquote scientific evidence these days doesn't really support them being awful for you. Now, whether you believe it or not, um, science um, is taking it on the chin a little bit uh, recently. Sometimes uh, scientific uh, knowledge, um, is there some bias or people paying for studies and that type of stuff? There is always the chance for a little bit of bias, so who knows? As a matter of fact, on Consumer Reports, they actually went down a notch in my book back during the gas stove ban controversy a few months ago. Um, they had a study showing that perhaps gas stoves were bad for you, but they took a huge donation from an environmental group with a, essentially a dog in the hunt. So uh, they kind of went down a little bit in credibility in my mind with that gas stove ban article they published. But they are saying the seed oil is not that bad for you. I do get a lot of people uh, requesting that I try beef tallow. So I did get some beef tallow and I've used a couple of spoonfuls of it so far. Happy with it so far. This Wagyu beef tallow from South Chicago Packing, not a sponsor. As a matter of fact, on a side note, I don't have any sponsors at the moment. If you want to be a sponsor of Uncle Scott's Kitchen, please get in touch. But this little container of South Chicago Packing beef tallow, about $30. So I'm happy with it so far, but compared to seed oils, very expensive. 
but maybe maybe you pay up for higher quality. I don't know, what do you guys think? Do you use the seed oils and don't worry about it? Do you use beef tallow? Do you use something else? What do you think about frying oils? Who knows? Let's see, carbon steel skillets and seasoning. I got an email or a comment from Harm Flow asking, I think about this skillet here, how does one get that beautiful deep black finish in the carbon steel skillet? Now around here, I often say, to just season a carbon steel skillet once and then just start cooking. Um, that's important if you're new to carbon steel. It's also important if you're good at carbon steel but also have a new pan because there's a learning curve with a new pan and uh, often it happens to everybody, you're gonna stick something early on. So if you worry too much about your seasoning early on, um, it's all gonna go for naught if you have to, if you stick something and have to scrub that pan down. Now, what about, when you've had your pan for a few months, what if you seasoned it a bunch of times and you've cooked a bunch in it and you can slide an egg and you're five, six months in, then what? Is it okay to worry about your seasoning then? I would say then it's okay to worry about your seasoning. And that's what I did with this pan. I seasoned it a bunch of times on my uh, stovetop. And I don't see a whole lot of other people doing it this way, but I would heat the pan up and put a drop of oil on a paper towel rub it around, let that smoke and harden in, take it off. And I've seen another video on the internet where they let the pan cool all the way back down and then repeat that process over and over and over. I didn't let my pan cool back down for much more than a minute or so and I would get it back on the flame and just keep doing that. I did that over and over and kind of darkened the seasoning in and let that harden in. If you know what you're doing and you're no longer a beginner with your carbon steel, by all means, spend some time on your pan and turn it into a work of art. It's kind of fun to do. Um, also along those lines, going back to getting started with the carbon steel, let me find it. Eh, sorry. Um, Club Casa with K's wrote in and asks, what happens if you season your carbon steel skillet and it comes out sticky? So if you've seasoned your pan, it comes out sticky. Normally what happens, as long as it's not a complete disaster, there's just a little bit too much oil on there and it didn't get hardened in. What you can do if you're seasoning on the stovetop, reheat that pan, uh, don't put any more oil in it. Wait until you see a wisp of smoke and then take it off the eye, let it cool down, run your fingers across once it's cool. And if it feels like cold, hard metal, then you're good to go. Also, if you're doing it in the oven, you may need to run it through one more time and let that sticky oil harden in. If it's a complete disaster, it's another story. Um, if you notice when we season a carbon steel skillet on the stovetop, we always put that millimeter of oil in the pan, bring it up to smoking, and then pour it out and wipe the pan until it looks dry. Uh, one time, someone didn't pour that oil out or let or uh, wipe the pan out until it looked dry. They tried to harden in that entire millimeter of oil. That is a disaster. And if you do that, um, you're almost in the range of needing to just go, it's almost easier to go buy another skillet, but you're gonna have to get that gunk off of there, either run it through a cleaning cycle on your oven, which I really only recommend as an absolute last resort, do that, be, be very careful if you do that. Or you can try vinegar, you can try tomatoes, um, steel wool, but you gotta get that gunk out of there if it's a true disaster. Usually just a little bit of stickiness, just reheat the pan and hope that it hardens in. Also, when I do that smoking this weekend and also when I do things like paella during the week, a lot of times I'm posting kind of some pictures and updates over on uh, Twitter. So if you follow me on Twitter, USK Uncle Scott, you can kind of follow along some of these things. Uh, it's kind of fun to uh, pick at me a little bit if, uh, if I'm doing something wrong or see if some of the food turns out um, okay. And it's a good way to kind of interact. So if you're interested, look for me at USK Uncle Scott on Twitter and give me a follow. Brussels sprouts. Don't talk a lot about Brussels sprouts around here, but in that Air Fryer Ninja review, I cooked some Air Fryer Brussels sprouts. Uh, Cat Daddy uh, 8427 wrote in and with a Brussels sprouts tip. He says, add some chopped dried cranberries with the, with the uh, sprouts. That actually sounds pretty good. And I think next time I make Brussels sprouts, I will try that. 
James M7584 wrote in and said, it was a great video, thank you. Um, and says, now Brussels sprouts are enjoyable. And he started enjoying Brussels sprouts like me when he turned about 30. And he says he eats them a couple times a week now. That's a, a lot. I eat them maybe twice a month, two, three times a month. And he mentions that Costco, again, Costco here, usually has a good size bag of fresh ones. We do get those from Costco and uh, they're usually pretty big. Uh, sometimes the bigger ones are a little bit um, faster to uh, prepare and get ready to cook rather than if you got a bunch of little ones. Boy, it takes a while to uh, prep those things to cook. Uh, someone with a dirty bad word in their name, I'm not going to pronounce it, asked why I used uh, gloves for handling raw chicken. Um, a lot of times, uh, I'm a bit of a germaphobe to begin with, but when I use raw chicken in the kitchen, uh, I'm a kind of a complete madman there, so I don't want any chicken contamination in the kitchen, so I kind of go the extra mile there. Also, doing these videos, I cook a lot more when I do a review than I normally would. And if I have to wash my hands and um, got my hands in dishwater and dish soap all day, cleaning pans and uh, doing more food for the videos, it actually makes my fingers crack and they sometimes bleed, which is awful. I don't want that to happen. So sometimes I just use gloves. Blood Gain wrote in. Uh, good to hear from Blood Gain. It's been a while. And said he just noticed the countertops in the man cave kitchen down here. And he says, I bet you hate those. Indeed, I do hate these countertops. These are tile countertops. And they're paired with a lot of golden oak. You've seen my other videos. We have a nice kitchen upstairs. We, when we moved in this house, we gutted that kitchen up there and about three quarters of my net worth went into the kitchen up there. This uh, basement kitchen, it's a man cave kitchen. So I will just deal with the uh, tile countertops until I win the lottery and then we will replace them. But they're, they're terrible. If you're getting countertops, don't go with tile. They are very hard. Uh, things can break on them. And the grout lines, you get food and stuff down in there. And they're just absolutely terrible. But okay for a man cave kitchen. Um, if you're into Kamado stuff, I'm starting to get, it, get more into Kamado uh, style cooking. I've uh, been doing a little bit of content about that. And I made these uh, shirts, these commodify, commodalized shirts. If you want to check one of those out, I will have links down below. Regarding the Ninja Air Fryer, I mentioned I didn't like the uh, buttons and the keypad. I don't like it as much as the uh, Philips Air Fryer we reviewed. The Philips has a couple of uh, knobs and they're a little bit more intuitive and uh, easy to use. Let's see, Ballet of Flexheim. I wrote in and said uh, he has an air fryer. He has to use it because his wife can't figure out the buttons. Um, Hired Gun 7996 uh, concurred with that and says he has the same conundrum with his wife. I've got a relative. I bought um, one of those Emerald um, 9 or 10 in 1, whatever, uh, convection ovens for two years ago. It's not been used one time because I think they can't figure out the buttons. So it just goes to show you that with a lot of buttons, they might add more functionality and more capability, but more buttons does not necessarily equal ease of use. Sometimes easier is better. And if you've got a few things that work well, that might be better than 20 things that no one can figure out. Who knows? Big holiday shopping season coming up. If you want to know about all the screaming deals that I see, and especially a big Debouye sale coming up, make sure you are subscribed to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. Um, I'm out there buying cookware for myself, just like everybody else. I typically buy eight, 10 pieces all right, around Black Friday, and that's what I will use to review for the ensuing four or five months. This is the time of year when the screaming deals arise. Make sure you're subscribed and I'll let you know when I see them. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Pancast.